All right, class, the next chapter up is chapter five, which we're going to talk about sudden illnesses. And in this chapter, we're going to talk about a variety of different um, conditions. What's important um, is if you're able to understand these certain um, illnesses that we're going to discuss, then you will hopefully be able to identify them uh, if you ever come in contact with them. In general, though, you may not always know what specific condition you're dealing with. It's important that you do know how to just generally approach and treat sudden illnesses. And as I mentioned, we are going to talk about a selection of sudden illnesses, their signs and symptoms, and some basic first aid you can do um, that is specific to that condition. So sudden illnesses in general, it's an acute illness that strikes suddenly and typically only lasts for a short amount of time. Um, does anyone have an example of an acute illness? Chronic Ill illnesses are conditions that someone uh, lives with and um, comes on and off over time. Try to think about a few conditions that would be considered chronic. So acutely you might be thinking of something like influenza, like the flu, or potentially uh, like a stomach bug, or bronchitis. A chronic illness could be something like diabetes, epilepsy, these are uh, both examples of something that would be considered a chronic illness. Some general signs and symptoms that someone is experiencing a sudden illness are uh, things such as trouble breathing, pain in the chest, head or abdomen, changes in the person's level of consciousness, dizziness, um, GI symptoms, so things such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach, abdominal cramping, fevers, changes in um, the skin, so pale or either flushed, hot or cold, uh, sweaty or dry, visual or speech problems, seizures, are numbness, weakness, and paralysis. Now these are just a, a laundry list of sudden, um, of signs and symptoms of sudden illnesses. There are more um, signs and symptoms than just these that are listed. Remember from chapter two, um, how to interview and check a person, and this will help you better understand what's wrong with them. So in general, how do you uh, handle a sudden illness? And we'll just use the example of you, you don't know exactly what's wrong with a person, but you are certain that there's something is wrong. If your initial check reveals anything that is considered life-threatening, so any of those life-threatening conditions or life-threatening signs and symptoms. And we talked about this in Chapter 2. There's a whole list of reasons to call 911 then you should stop what you're doing um, and call 911 or have someone else call 911. You can next provide uh, the appropriate care based off of the signs and symptoms and the level of your training. As mentioned previously, the general guidelines you should follow whenever you're handling or caring for someone. Um, you should do no further harm. Monitor the person's breathing and consciousness level. Help the person rest in a comfortable position. Reassure them. And provide the care that is appropriate for that emergency. And never go above your training level. So now we're going to actually start to dive into specific conditions. Uh, respiratory distress, which we refer to as difficulty breathing, is noted by shortness of breath gasping for breath, hyperventilating, or pain uh, with breathing. Respiratory distress can turn into respiratory arrest, 
which is no breathing at all, or what we call that agonal breathing. Um, it's, it's not normal breathing whatsoever. Causes for respiratory uh, distress or arrest are things such as uh, asthma, COPD, infections. Can anyone think of any types of infections? So you might be thinking of things like bronchitis, allergic reactions, heart conditions, trauma, so being hit in the chest or being hit in the abdomen, poisoning, an overdose, being electrocuted, or mental health conditions, such as, uh, for example, if someone has a anxiety, they might have an anxiety attack. Not being able to breathe is a really scary moment uh, for the person who it's happening to. And because they're scared, the breathing has become, become even more difficult. Also, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to communicate to you in a clear way or potentially in complete sentences. Some signs and symptoms of respiratory distress are uh, noises such as wheezing, gurgling, or high-pitched sounds, unusually slow or fast breathing, unusually deep or shallow or irregular breathing, moist, pale, blue, or flesh skin, and um, dizzy or lightheadedness. So how do we handle respiratory distress uh, situations? It's really important to act quickly when someone is having uh, difficulty breathing because these conditions can quickly develop into something more serious, um, as in they could uh, go into respiratory arrest, uh, they could stop breathing altogether, which could then ultimately lead to uh, cardiac arrest. If someone's having trouble breathing, call 911 or have someone else call 911 and provide the appropriate care until help arrives. Now we're going to talk about um, asthma and anaphylaxia, but um, if it's either of these conditions, uh, one of the steps you might take is to uh, aid the person in taking their medication. We're going to talk about this more specifically. Something else you can do is have the person sit down and remain calm. Try to gather more information if they are responsive um, and, and try to do so by just asking yes or no questions. Since they are having trouble breathing, it's going to be difficult for them to get full um, sentence answers out to you. Or yes or no answers can um, just allow it so that they can head, uh, shake their head yes or no. Also, be prepared to administer CPR and the use of an AD if the person becomes unresponsive. So asthma, asthma is, results in uh, respiratory distress oftentimes, and it can uh, result in respiratory um, arrest. Asthma is a chronic condition in which um, you have inflammation creating a narrowing of the airway. Now we could go into even more of uh, the science behind it, but for this class, you just need to understand that it will cause inflammation and narrowing of the airway, and whenever we have narrowing in the airway, breathing is going to become difficult. Now, um, asthma can be triggered, uh, asthma attacks can be triggered by things, causing uh, what we refer to as an asthma attack or an as asthma episode. Common triggers um, include, can anyone think of, is if anyone has asthma or knows someone that has asthma, they might know what might trigger an asthma attack. Common things are people have what's called sports-induced asthma, so exercise. Especially exercise in uh, temperature changes, uh, like really cold air and really hot air. Allergies, uh, 
to maybe pollens, animal, dander. Sometimes perfumes can cause someone to trigger an asthma attack. Being sick, so maybe having a respiratory infection. Stress and anxiety could also uh, trigger an asthma attack. People with known asthma typically know what their triggers are so they can take preventative measures so that they don't suffer from an asthma attack. But people who don't know they have asthma, it, sometimes it takes a little while to de de determine to define what their triggers are. Also, people with diagnosed asthma uh, may have been prescribed medications. Some cases, people are prescribed long-term medications that are taken re uh, regularly. And this medica these medications help to prevent attacks by overall uh, reducing inflammation and swelling. Quick relief medications, things that people most commonly think of as the little red um, inhaler. These are medications that people use when they are acutely having an asthma attack. Sometimes they're also prescribed um, for people to take right before they're going to um, maybe participate or come in to contact with a trigger. So for an example, an athlete may be told by their physician to take their quick relief medication um, just prior to exercise. These medications work to relax the muscles and open the airway quickly. Both medications um, may be given through inhalers, nebulizers, or and a lot of times the long-term medications, sometimes they're taken in an actual pill form. Box uh, 5-1 will show you uh, asthma inhalers and nebulizers and how they're um, administered. Although asthma attacks can be um, prevented, people still uh, experience the occasional flare-ups, especially early on when someone has just been diagnosed with asthma. They more commonly have um, more asthma attacks. As someone has um, had the condition longer, they are more aware of what's going to trigger and uh, try to prevent those triggers from happening. Signs and symptoms that someone suffering from an asthma attack are things such as wheezing or coughing. So if you're talking with someone when they're having an asthma attack, when they exhale, you'll commonly hear that wheezing sound in that breath. Rapid, shallow breathing. Sweating. A lot of times they'll complain of a tight feeling in their chest and their throat. People who are suffering from an asthma attack uh, commonly start to become very anxious and fearful. Um, I've had people begin crying um, because it's a very scary moment when you aren't able to breathe normally. So how can we help someone who is experiencing an asthma attack? And if you have never experienced, ha uh, come into contact with someone experiencing an asthma attack, I'm sure you will at some point in time um, in your life. It is a pretty common condition. So it's important to know how to recognize it as well as treat it. Um, because asthma can be life-threatening if it isn't managed properly. People who have asthma may have an action plan uh, defined by the physician as to how to manage an attack. Um, so you can ask them you know, what their plan is. Encourage the use of the quick relief medication, it, should they have it on them. Skill sheet 5-1 uh, is going to give instructions on how to assist someone with using their medication. You should never administer this medication on your own. You should just um, offer to help or assist in the event um, they need your assistance. Most of the time, um, people will be uh, able to go ahead and take their medication themselves, um, but they may um, 
not have the medication right there next to them. Um, so you might be uh, running back into maybe a room, into their backpack, looking for the medication for them. Call 911 if a person does not improve within minutes of taking their medication or they become unresponsive. If you have a situation in which someone appears to be suffering from an asthma attack and they don't have any form of medication, it's better to just go ahead and call 911. That way help can arrive and, and take over because the last thing you want to do is have this person go um, unresponsive on you because they aren't able to get enough oxygen into their lungs. Next condition we're going to talk about is an allergic reaction and anaphylaxia. So sometimes our immune system sees things that we would consider ordinary. Um, your body actually sees them as being harmful. When this happens, the immune system overreacts in a way, causing you to have what's called an allergic reaction. What are some things people are commonly allergic to? And some of you may have your own allergies as well. So some things that come to mind um, are animal and pet dander. Some people are allergic to outdoor pollen, so pollens from plants, grass. Some other things such as foods. People have a lot of different food allergies, so whether it be being allergic to peanuts or tree nuts, shellfish, um, dairy products, wheat or gluten. Some people are also allergic to medications. Common uh, medication allergies are uh, penicillins and sulfa drugs. Someone who is having a mild to moderate reaction um, may just experience mild symptoms. So things such as a skin rash or itchy skin, they may become a little stuffy, a stuffy nose, maybe watery eyes, reddening eyes. Okay, these are all um, more of your mild to moderate reactions and they are not considered uh, severe or life-threatening. Someone who's having a severe life-threatening allergic reaction, we call anaphylaxis, may develop more severe signs and symptoms such as difficulty breathing, swelling of the face, neck, tongue, or lips. So if the tongue and, and the throat and the face begin to swell, the person is going to have extreme difficulty breathing and getting any air past their, um, through their airway. They may feel n very nauseous. They may begin to vomit. The person may complain of being dizzy. Lack of oxygen will uh, create, uh, make someone feel dizzy. Tightness in the chest as well as the throat. So not just being itchy, but having actually big uh, red hives or welts on their skin. Change in consciousness as well as loss of consciousness. And any symptoms of shock, and we will be talking about shock in a few chapters from now, um, but some si symptoms of shock are excessive thirst, moist pale skin, and a rapid weak heartbeat, as well as an altered level of consciousness. If you refer to Table 5-1, it's referring to how do you know if it's an anaphylactic reaction. So it gives you a few examples, what you're looking for.
So how do we care for the anaphylactic reaction or allergic reaction? So if the person is showing signs of an anaphylactic reaction, it's really important to um, summon EMS immediately. So calling 911 or that designated number as soon as you have determined that you feel the person is suffering from a uh, severe anaphylactic reaction. It's really important to act quickly. Uh, these reactions can worsen within moments and can result in death. A person with a known allergy may be carrying medication, especially if they know that this allergy causes them to go into an anaphylactic reaction. The medication that they carry is called an epinephrine injector. You may have to offer to help administer the medication. Um, if the person does have medication and you are in the middle of helping and there's no one else around to call, you should um, help them administer this medication prior to calling 911. You can also have the person lie in the comfortable position while you help wait for help to arrive. So epinephrine is the medication used to reverse the effects of uh, the reaction. As I said, people with known allergies that do result in these anaphylactic reactions will be prescribed an epinephrine auto-injector. There are different doses based off the weight. Um, you should never share an epinephrine um, from one person to another. You want to make sure that it's properly prescribed for that person. Um, but 0.15 milligrams are used for children between the weights of 33 and 66 pounds, and 0.3 is used for anyone over 66 pounds. It is advised that people with a known history do carry two auto injectors with them at all times. If the first one doesn't help, a second one can be administered. If the person is having a difficult time, you may need to assist them with their um, EpiPen, but only when the person has a previous diagnosis and is prescribed the medication. The person is having signs and symptoms of an anaphylactic reaction. The, rep the person requ actually requests your help and state laws allow you to do so. Some states will actually allow organizations such as schools to keep a stock of epinephrine auto injectors to use in the event of an emergency. So um, say you're working in a school one day and a student in the cafeteria consumes some food that they never previously had an allergic reaction to and they start showing these severe um, allergic symptoms. Um, in some cases, you will be allowed to go ahead and administer these stock epinephrine auto-injectors. So how to use an epinephrine auto-injector? Skill Sheet 5-2 has a detailed step-by-step -step in instructions on assisting someone with an epinephrine auto-injector. As I, as I said, you are just assisting them. You are not administering the medication yourself. So the device is activated by pushing it against the outer thigh. In the previous slide, there you go. So down the bottom here, this is an example of an EpiPen. And I do have a practice one that I will show you in class with. Um, but there's a really large needle within that vial and then the medication is just within there. So by pressing the orange end into the thigh, you'll release that needle and that needle will be injected um, in penetrate into the skin and into the muscle, releasing that epinephrine into the thigh muscle. The device needs to be held in place for approximately 5 to 10 seconds. Once you've held it there, you can remove it. It is recommended that you massage the area. The person can massage the area themselves 
to move the medication around as quick as possible. Always be cautious when handling the used device. You want to make sure that you don't stick yourself with the needle. And dispose of the device in a hard container and give it to EMS for proper disposal. Now, there are also medications referred to as antihistamines. A lot of people have heard of Benadryl. Benadryl is an example of an antihistamine. A healthcare provider may also suggest a person with an allergy carry antihistamines with them in, a, in addition to epinephrine. Antihistamines are medications that counteract a chemical in the body called histamine, so antihistamine, which is released during an allergic reaction. Antihistamines are over-the-counter medications and can be found in pill, capsule, or liquid forms. And antihistamines should be used according to the medication level. Now, you can use antihistamines for your more mild to moderate allergic reactions as well. So if you um, are suffering from an allergy to, we'll say, pet dander, and you're getting really those itchy, scratchy eyes, sneezy um, symptoms, if you take um, a medication such as Benadryl or any type of antihistamine, it will help to minimize those symptoms. Next condition we're going to discuss are diabetic emergencies. Now, diabetes is a chronic condition in which the body is unable to process glucose, sugar, uh, glucose, which is sugar, in the bloodstream. There are um, two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. The pancreas um, is an organ in the body that secretes insulin, and insulin is actually a hormone that controls the, your blood glucose levels. So when a person has diabetes, their pancreas is either um, failing to make enough insulin or it's unable to respond to insulin. So either it really doesn't make insulin at all or it doesn't know how to control how much insulin is um, released. People with diabetes may manage the condition with an insulin injection or they may be um, controlling it with an oral medication, or in some cases, both. Food intake, exercise, and medications can help keep a diabetic well-balanced. People with diabetes should follow a strict diet, limiting their sweets, carbs, fats, and also the timing of their meals is really important. If a person um, is not well balanced, they might experience um, diabetic emergencies such as hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia is when there is too uh, low of blood glucose levels, and hyperglycemia is high blood glu uh, glucose levels. Now, you don't have to have diabetes to experience these hypoglycemia are hyperglycemia um, attacks. Now, we'll say you have um, my class at 8 a.m. and you failed to have anything to eat before you came to class and you're running the class and, and you're already tired. And then you sit through my class for, we'll say you're 45 minutes in. You might be starting to experience some um, hypoglycemia because you haven't had anything to eat and your blood glucose levels are going to become low. Hypoglycemia can be caused by missing meals or just simply not eating enough. Large amounts of exercise with lack of food intake. Vomiting. Or taking too much medication in the, in the incidence of um, a diabetic, they may take too much of their insulin. Hyperglycemia can be caused by eating too much food. Also, those high sugary foods and high carbohydrate foods. 
not taking enough medication, so not, um, not taking enough insulin in the case of a diabetic. Low exercise levels, so you're not burning off that sugar and using that sugar up in your body, as well as emotional stressors. Signs and symptoms of a diabetic emergency is someone just may generally feel ill or just not feel well. Um, dizziness or shakiness, this is commonly a hypoglycemic symptom. A headache is also a hypoglycemic um, sign or symptom. Cool, clammy skin. Behavioral changes can be both. I always think about, you know, be, people being hangry or hungry. So they're, they're, uh, when they're hungry, they get angry. Sweet, fruity smelling breath. This is commonly your hyperglycemia. So think about hyper, meaning too much sugar. So if there's too much sugar in there, they might actually um, start to smell sweet. Some confusion, loss of consciousness, and also seizures. So how are we going to handle the diabetic emergency? We're going to go ahead and call 911 if the person is unresponsive, not fully alert, or if they are having a seizure. While you're waiting, you can provide the appropriate care by interviewing the person if they are, um, if you are able to get answers from them, or interview the bystanders around them if there are any. Performing a head-to-toe check to make sure that nothing else is wrong. And monitor their breathing. If you do have a person that's have, suffering a diabetic emergency who has gone unresponsive and is not breathing, then you do need to be ready to administer CPR. The person knows they have diabetes, they may um, know what they need um, to help them. Most commonly you're going to deal with the hypoglycemia um, incidences, so where people's blood sugar levels are dropping low. If they are, you can um, offer them sugar. If they're responsive and they are able to swallow, What are some acceptable forms of sugar? So if someone's suffering from a diabetic emergency, um, what type of sugar, what's an example of a sugar that you could give them? So for example, some people may have heard of glucose tablets. Okay, they're just basically a little sugar pill. You can offer um, a candy. Just make sure that the candy can be chewed. Other things that are high in sugar um, are things such as fruit juices, as well as regular non-diet sodas. You could simply just put straight sugar right into a glass of water and have them drink that. Really what you want to do is you want to make sure that the sugar you're giving them is going to break down quickly. So the liquid forms are going to be one of your um, best options. The glucose tablets do dissolve very quickly, so they are a good option too. But anything that someone really has to process, um, do a lot of chewing, shouldn't be your first option if you do have a liquid form or a glucose tablet. If someone is a known diabetic, they could go ahead and check their blood glucose levels. They may need to administer their own insulin or medication, especially if their blood glucose levels are high. If you are dealing with a person who is responsive and alert, um, but they just don't feel better within about 10 to 15 minutes of administering their sugar or, their, um, or administering insulin, you should go ahead and call 911.
The next condition we're going to discuss are seizures. Seizures are the result of an abnormal um, brain activity, which can result in the person um, having temporary or involuntary changes in body movement, function, sensations, and awareness or behavior. Seizures can be caused by a condition called epilepsy. Epilepsy is a chronic illness, um, which is a seizure disorder. So people suffering from epilepsy um, may have seizures regularly. They may have seizures um, once a week, once a month. Um, they may be controlled really well that they only have them, you know, every few years. Especially when someone is um, early diagnosed with epilepsy, um, it takes a long time for the medication to be sorted out. And even when the medication does get figured out to be, you know, the best dosage to control the seizures, um, sometimes uh, down the road, that dosage might not be the right one anymore, and they might have to change the dosage again. You don't have to have epilepsy to have a seizure, though. Seizures can be caused by a spike in a really high fe fever. In um, small infants, we call them febrile seizures. So a small child spikes a really high fever, and they, um, they have a seizure. Infections can cause seizures. Uh, diabetic emergencies. Heat stroke as well as injuries to the brain. There are different types of seizures. It's not really important that you fully understand all the different types of seizures. Um, but you can have um, grand mal and petit mal seizures, which are your seizures that result in actual convulsions. Um, grand mal's uh, last longer than petit mal's. Then you can also have what's referred to as an absence seizure. Um, and these actually you don't have any type of convulsions at all. Signs and symptoms of a seizure. Um, if someone's truly having a, a grand or petite mal seizure, it's pretty easy to identify. If you've never seen one before and even if it's just um, you saw a fake one on TV, it's pretty easy to look at that person and say, I do believe they're having a seizure. Person who um, is about to have the seizure, and especially in um, cases of epilepsy, they might experience what's called an aura or aura. This is an unusual sensation or feeling that they have just before the onset of the seizure. If someone, um, especially someone who has epilepsy, is able to recognize that aura quickly enough, they might tell you that it's about to happen before it happens. Or in some cases, they may... Um, know what to do. There are also service dogs for this as well. The service dogs are trained to react to the aura. So they can sense the aura and they react to it um, by barking or leading um, their human to a safer place. I knew someone who um, they had enough time from when they felt their um, aura come on, and they said it was only a couple moments, um, but they could um, get themselves to a safe place. So if they were on stairs, they could try to get to flat ground, laying themselves down on their side. Another sign or symptom is just a sudden collapse and a sudden loss of consciousness. Also, um, people who are having absence seizure, seizures, so like as I mentioned, they don't have convulsions. Um, they actually just experience uh, a blank stare. 
So it's almost kind of like they just zone out for a few moments and then they just kind of snap back to again. So how are we going to care for and handle um, a seizure situation? Most seizures only will last a few moments. And while they are um, very scary and traumatizing, they are relatively easy to handle. If a person has a known um, seizure condition such as epilepsy, it's not always going to be necessary that you call 911 every single time. You're going to go ahead and call for help if the seizure has lasted for longer than five minutes or they have multiple seizures in a row. So say they have a seizure and within a few more minutes they have another seizure again. The person is injured from the seizure. The person is unresponsive and not breathing or having extreme difficulty breathing. The seizure was brought on by a a severe fever, high fever. The person is elderly or are very young. It is the first seizure and there is no known um, cause of it. The seizure took place in water or the person is pregnant or has diabetes. When a person is actively having a seizure, and we're referring to a seizure in, which is resulting in convulsions, don't ever try to hold the person down. What's best is to just allow them to um, go through with their seizure. You can, though, move furniture objects away that might be around them that could harm them. Check the person for responsiveness once the seizure has concluded. You can also check the person from head to toe to make sure that no other injuries have occurred. Stay with the person until he or she is um, fully recovered or help arrives. If the person is unresponsive and not breathing, you're going to need to begin CPR. And when you have one, use an AED as soon as possible. Our little fact in fiction for you. Should you place something like a bite stick in someone's mouth during a seizure? So the initial thought behind this is to prevent someone from swallowing or biting off their own tongue. You should not place anything in the person's mouth uh, when they are having a seizure. It really is impossible to swallow your own tongue. And although the person might bite down um, very hard, causing bleeding, it's not common that they would actually bite off their tongue. The person might actually bite down so hard um, that they do uh, bite the bite stick in half and then begin to choke on it. So you should never stick anything in a person who is suffering from a seizure. Uh, you should never stick anything in their mouth, especially your own fingers. Also, someone who is um, suffering from a seizure um, may foam at the mouth. They may vomit. So it might be necessary once they um, have concluded their seizure to roll them on their side and clean out and clear out uh, their airway. Placing them in the recovery position is a very good, safe position to place them in um, to prevent them from choking.
Okay, the next condition we're going to talk about is fainting. Maybe some of you have fainted before or felt like you were going to faint. Fainting is just simply when someone suddenly loses consciousness and then regains um, consciousness quickly within, within moments. Fainting is caused uh, by a sudden decrease in blood flow to the brain. And typically the cause of, of a fainting incident is not a serious um, condition. Can anyone think of any common causes of fainting? So one, for example, is being dehydrated, not having enough fluid in your body. Being too overheated, being really hot. Uh, feeling intense emotions. Sometimes when people stand still for a really long time, so for example, like in the military, if people stand um, very straight for a long time with their knees locked out, they can faint. The great thing is, as soon as someone faints and falls over, their head is now um, in the same level of their heart and everything. And so the blood will kind of rush back to the brain and they'll regain consciousness very quickly. Signs and symptoms are initially, before the person actually faints, they may uh, appear very pale, very sweaty. They may feel weak or dizzy. And they also might just have that overwhelming feeling that they're about to faint. So if possible, um, prevent it um, from happening. So if someone immediately begins to complain of any of those symptoms, have them sit with their head uh, between their knees or have them lie down flat on their back. However, sometimes you don't have enough time. Someone might um, complain that they feel really dizzy and when with, within moments they collapse. If the person does faint, check for responsiveness and breathing. If the person does respond and is breathing normally, proceed with an interview and head to toe check. Just try to figure out why they fainted. Call 911 or the designated number if the person has any injuries that are of concern or any other concerning conditions. So we did say that fainting is usually a result of nothing serious. However, if someone can faint um, from a more severe medical condition. If EMS is not summoned, the person should follow up with their health care provider. Tell them that they fainted and um, talk about ways to prevent them from fainting again. If the person does not respond and is not breathing, begin CPR and the use of an AED as soon as possible. And I do believe this is the last condition. The last condition we're going to talk about is a stroke. Now, a stroke is similar to that of a heart attack, but it affects the brain. So just as we mentioned with the heart, uh, when we have decreased amount of blood getting to the heart tissue, the um, heart tissue will die. So in a stroke, we're going to have a decreased amount of um, blood flow to the brain. And this might be caused by a blood clot. And it may result in death of brain cells and brain tissue. Strokes can also be caused by a massive um, bleed in the brain's tissue. Strokes can cause permanent brain damage. However, for the, however, if the appropriate actions are taken quickly, we can try to limit um, the damage and um, hopefully create a reversible situation. Strokes do uh, most commonly occur in elderly adults. 
However, they um, have been known to happen in younger individuals as well. I um, know of an athlete who was lifting and um, had uh, suffered from a stroke when they were lifting. Uh, TIAAs or transient ischemic attacks are what we refer to as mini strokes. So remember we talked about mini heart attacks? Well, you can also have a mini stroke. They can manifest uh, many of the same symptoms as a stroke, but they do go away. However, people um, who have shown symptoms of these mini strokes are at high risk for developing a full-on stroke kind of like a warning sign and half of them will result within a uh, result in a full stroke within 48 hours so it's really important to um, handle transient ischemic attacks or mini strokes um, just as you would a regular stroke signs and symptoms are trouble with speech and slurring of words drooling or difficulty swallowing trouble seeing, weakness, paralysis or numbness of the face, arms, legs. And a lot of these symptoms are going to be one-sided uh, because if the damage occurs to one side of the brain, um, so the left side of the brain, for example, you'll actually see these um, symptoms and signs in the right side of the body. A very sudden, severe headache, loss of balance, confusion and loss of consciousness. The FAST check is a quick way to check for signs and symptoms of a stroke and you can see this in figure 5-1. Just gonna back up one. So with FAST, um, F stands for face, so ask the person to smile, and if there's weakness or drooping of one side of their face, this is a sign of a stroke. A stands for arm. Ask them to raise both arms, and if they are unable to do so with one arm or it's dramatically weaker than the other, then th that is also a sign of a stroke. Ask this person um, to simply say an easy phrase. Or just in their response to you, you might notice slurring of their speech. And T stands for time. So if the person is having any difficulty with the previous three maneuvers with the F, A, or S, then you need to go ahead and call 911 immediately. It's very vital um, in, in a stroke, just as it is with a heart attack, to get more advanced help there as quick as possible because these people are going to need um, higher level of um, trained professionals and medical professionals to diagnose and um, treat the condition. So make sure that you know FAST, why we use it, and what it stands for. So how do we care for someone who's suffering from a stroke? If you feel like someone is having a stroke or had a stroke, you need to call 911 or the designated number immediately. If you can, take note to the length of time the symptoms were occurring. It's important to relay this information to EMS. Stay with the person and reassure them until help arrives. If the person is responsive but not fully awake, put the person in the recovery position. And if the person is unresponsive and is not breathing, begin CPR and the use of an AED. It's got a long list of review questions for you, but there are several conditions we just talked about. So make sure you take time to review these questions. Try to answer these questions on your own. If needed, use the supplemental material using, uh, so use the book and the PowerPoint to try to answer these questions. That is, will be helpful for you uh, for quiz purposes as well as exam purposes. And we'll talk about some of these conditions um, more specifically in class.
See you soon.